Good morning, friends, and it's almost Happy New Year. I want us to think a little bit about moving into a new year, uh, what I might call even a new season, a time to turn the page and uh, get a new beginning. I love this time of year. It's a time of reflection for me, of remembering and thinking back on the highs, the lows, the good, the hardships, um, and always in the midst of it, what I can always find is the faithfulness of God. You know, he's a God that doesn't change. He's faithful. He's faithful even when we can't tell that he's been faithful. I promise you one day it will all make sense. And so at this time of year in reflection, I always try to consider what do I want to take with me from the old year? And um, what do I want to leave behind? I love that passage in Deuteronomy 1. I think it's verse 6 or 7, and it it's the very beginning of the verse, and it says, you've been at this mountain long enough. It's time to pack your bags and move on. That would be my paraphrase of it. What do we want to pack into our bags as we move into this new year? You know, in the Lord, there are always seasons, and it's important to be fruitful in whatever season you are in in your life, and God created you to be fruitful in all seasons. Listen to what it says in Psalm 1. This is what he's speaking. Uh, he's speaking to us, his children. He shall be, she shall be like a tree firmly planted and tended by the streams of water, ready to bring forth fruit, its fruit in its season, ready to bring forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf also shall not fade or wither, and everything he does shall prosper and come to maturity. He wants us to produce fruit that is... Uh, in line with the season that we're in. You know, I'm in a different season than I was 30 years ago. And one of the things I've found in life is you, it's very easy to keep trying to look back or to try to reproduce. And that's just simply not going to happen. And so we want to be fruitful in the season that we're in. And there are things that hinder and there are things that then help us to produce this fruit. We need to take with us what will help us and not what will hinder us. I listened to a message, gosh, it's been about three or four months ago now, easily, and it was talking about the Passover and when when the Lord gave instructions to the Israelites to get ready, he was going to pass over, and that the door was going to open and they were going to get out. And one of the things this minister brought out was it was interesting in all the detail that God had given them through all of this season of preparing them to move on. He didn't tell them, get the bread on early so it can rise and you can take your bread with you. In fact, they had to leave without the bread being leavened. And I think that was with great purpose for a lot of reasons, and we don't need to get into all of that today. But what interested me was the word leaven. So I got to looking into it. We know in Scripture, leaven is, is compared to something that creates issues. It, it, you know, it affects a whole group, blah, blah, blah. However, in the instance of leaven in Exodus 12 and 13, when you look into the word, it means this. It's yeast, and it means sharp, sour, or bitter. Could it be that he wanted them to leave behind in this new season anything that was sharp, sour, or bitter, to throw it out? It's interesting, you know, uh, yeast causes bread to rise, so I want you to think of this. What gets a rise out of you? What causes anger to come? What, what causes you to be thrown back into something that is not healthy in your mind, in your body, whatever it is? What is it that still haunts you, um, holds you back? It's time to let that go. Don't let it be brought into a new season. It's a time, this uh, at this time of year, I think it's a time where we, we not only, only reflect, we ask the Lord to examine us. Uh, it's like Psalm 139 says, search me and try me, O Lord. Let him search us and bring to mind anything that, that is not pleasing to him. Search me and try me. See if there's any crooked or wicked way in me. See if there's any way in me that's not pleasing, that is not in keeping with who you've created me to be or causes me to misrepresent you in any way. Show me where it is. Show me where it is so that, Lord, I can repent and let you remove that from me. What is it he might be showing you? I've of late found myself getting aggravated in ways I used to never, and I know there's something he's dealing with in me. And while I don't have to tell you what it is, I can tell you I'm glad he's dealing with me because 
He loves me. He deals with us. He brings those things to the surface so he can show us what he's working on so we can cooperate with him. And that is his great love for us. One of the things, though, he did want the Israelites to take out with them was a knowledge of who he was and a belief in his goodness. I think we've looked at this together, but we're going to look at it again for this end of the year thought. And it's from Hebrews 3, and it goes into 4. And he's speaking of them once they got into the, uh, the, the desert. You know, they'd crossed over uh, the Red Sea. They were now out in the wilderness. They were in the desert. They were wandering. And they never caught sight of God's goodness to them in the midst of that. You know, the provision, when you look back, uh, their shoes didn't wear out. Manna, they might have got, may have gotten tired of it, but they had enough every day to take care of them and keep them healthy even. But it says this in Hebrews 3, 9, where your fathers tried my patience and they tested my forbearance and found I stood their test and they saw my works for 40 years. Many of us can look back for even more than 40 years and see his works. And it says, so I was provoked and displeased and sorely grieved with that generation and said, listen to this, they always err and are led astray in their hearts. It's a heart issue. And they have not perceived or recognized my ways and become progressively better and more experimentally and intimately acquaint, acquainted with them. And then he says, so they're not going to enter my rest. What are his ways? The way, His ways, it, it's his character. They had not married what he did with who he was and why he did things. His character was faithfulness. You know, it says of Moses, he knew the ways of God. The children of Israel saw the acts, but they never really got to know his ways. They didn't marry them to the character of God and his keeping power and his loving power. And then it goes on and it says, they're not going to be able to enter into this rest because of their unwillingness to adhere to, trust in and rely on God. Unbelief shut them out. We want to leave unbelief in the background. We don't want to take it with us. No unbelief. It doesn't mean we don't struggle along the way to believe, but the unbelief that begins to doubt in the goodness of God. And I know all of us have seen a lot these last months, weeks, and years. We've seen loss. I've, I've had many friends in the last couple of months who've known great loss, deaths, and painful things. But does it make God less faithful? No. I will tell you this. I don't know how people make it at times like that without Jesus. I just don't know how you do it. Anyway, going on, it says in Hebrews 4, now put yourself in this position. Therefore, while this promise of entering his rest still holds and is offered today, let us be afraid to distrust it, lest any of you should think, think, you know, heart, think, he has come too late and has come short of reaching it. It's not too late to enter into his rest. What is rest? To enter into his rest is to choose to trust him even when you don't understand. Indeed, it says they've had the glad tidings of the gospel. Uh, just like the Israelites, is he saying to you, I'm, I'm wooing you into my rest. I'm wooing to you, uh, you into the reality of my faithfulness and my goodness. Choose trust. Choose trust. It is a choice. And then he goes on at the end of chapter 4, one of my very favorite passages. He's been speaking of the fact that he is a man acquainted with all of our struggles, our temptations. He knows the infirmities we struggle against within us. He said he's acquainted with all of that. He came, he was Emmanuel, God with us, and he came and he experienced our humanity yet without sin. Hard to imagine, but he did it. Then he goes on. Because of that, let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near to the throne of grace, the throne of God's unmerited favor to us sinners, that we may receive mercy for our failures and find grace in help, uh, to help in good time for every need, appropriate help, well-timed help, coming just when we need it most. I heard our pastors did a message this last Sunday on mercy and grace. Mercy uh, is not getting what you do deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Sometimes we have to face his mercy before we can move to his grace. His mercy allows me to see that I don't deserve a thing. 
I don't deserve a thing. In fact, I, I, I don't deserve his goodness. I don't deserve his faithfulness. And yet, he still gives that because that's part of the price he paid for us on Calvary. We cannot ever walk away from Calvary. Then we move to the resurrection. And out of the power of the Holy Spirit, we enter into the reality that it's gr by grace we've been saved. Not of works, grace. Enter into trust and really believe that. He paid a price for us to be a people who live at rest, in peace, choose trust. My scripture as we enter into this New Year's is a passage I've long loved. Listen to this. I have a lot of passages I've long loved. If you haven't figured that out by now, you don't, you're not paying attention. May the God of your hope so fill you with joy and peace in believing, believing, through the experience of your faith, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may be, may abound and be overflowing, bubbling over with hope. When you choose trust, hope will enter into your heart. And where there's hope, there's got to be joy. And out of that, we can live in peace. And you know, peace is a person and he lives within us and the Holy Spirit makes him real. If you don't know that today, today choose him. Choose trust. Choose to believe that he paid the price out of his mercy on Calvary so you could know him, even though you don't deserve him. Don't try to come in by your works. It'll never work. But choose to believe he came. He lived among us, sinless, went to that cross, died for us, went to the grave, and then rose again in victory over death, hell, and all that the world would bring against us. Yes, there is a lot coming against us, but choose. I was reminded of a passage I've long loved from Isaiah 37. It's, it's where he says it's a day of distress and rebuke. Children are ready to come to the birth and we don't have the strength to bring them forth. It reminds me of this reality. In our generation, there's something to be birthed. In this next year, there's something to be birthed. And the time and the tactic, it never changes. The time is, it's in your generation. It's for you to be a part of now. The tactic of the enemy does not change either. It's to so wear us down, causing us to doubt the goodness of God that we don't have strength within us. The joy of the Lord is our strength. If we lose it, we don't have the strength to bring to birth what is on his heart to bring forth. The enemy of the Israelites in that day was Assyria. And Assyria means evil counsel. What are you listening to? Are you listening to the voice of the Holy Spirit saying, Hang in there. Trust. He's faithful. He's not going to be as a fickle lover to you. He's good, and he will stand with you, beside you, in you. He's with you. He is with you. Are you listening to the voice of the world, of the fear, of all the clamoring and chaos? I'm going to choose trust. I'm going to choose joy. I'm going to choose peace. I'm going to choose hope. Why? Because the Holy Spirit wants to make that real in me, and I choose to listen to him. Will you join me in listening to him for the end of this year to let go what has brought sourness, bitterness, anything in us that is not good? Leave it behind. Leave it behind so that we can walk into this new season fruitful in this generation, in the hour we're living in now. I believe we're on the, the very brink of something great, is it going to come with a price? Yes, it will. But you know what? It's going to be worth every bit of it because the Lord is going to awaken his people to the wonder of who he is. And I want to be a part of that reawakening. I want to be a part of revival. I want to be a part of seeing his plans and purposes come to pass within my life, within my family, within my church, within my city, my state, and certainly within this country. He is well able. He is able I love that passage. I believe it's in one of the Timothys where it says, I know whom I have believed in, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have entrusted to him against that day. I believe that. He is trustworthy. Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus, in the anyone listening to the sound of my voice through this video, if they don't know you, that they would choose you. If they've known you and walked away, they'd come back. Lord, we choose trust today. We choose hope today. We choose you today. Holy Spirit, make yourself more real 
and all the clamoring voices around us. Tune us to the still small voice that you come to whisper in our ear. Cause us, Lord, to leave behind what we don't need to drag on with us. Give us the right lens on the soul of our spirit to see with eyes as you see. Adjust the frames that we see through, that we see from your perspective, and not ours, not man's, but yours. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your faithfulness. Be with those who've struggled and, and have hurt and grieve right now. Comfort them, hold them, and Lord, make real to them how wondrous you really are. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Happy New Year.